you have your Bible, you got it there, and you're in Psalms 85, we're going to stand in honor of reading God's Word. We're going to look at the entire chapter, really just to look at one verse. And we're going to look at quite a bit of Scripture today. So let's see what it is that God has to say for us today. Psalms 85. This was written, this was actually a song that was written and sung by the people in celebration of when the children of Israel came back from captivity. Babylon had taken them, captured them, and, and they had spent 70 years as slaves in Babylon. And then after that, they began to trickle back in and to come back into the, to the, the promised land, uh, to the Jerusalem and, and, the, and the lands of Israel. And they had this song and sang this song about that experience. Verse 1, Lord, you have been favorable to your land. Now, isn't it intriguing that they say to them after they had been in captivity and slaves that he says they, their, their reply back to him was, you've been a good God. You have done very much. You have been very favorable to us. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Then they says, restore us. You know, Israel at one time had been a, a very powerful and a glorious place. They had kings like David. They had the great temple that Solomon built that people would come from all over the world to come and worship Jehovah God. And yet they found themselves in a dilapidated place and they pray this prayer, they sing this song saying, Restore us, O God, of our salvation. Cause your anger uh, toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your mercy, Lord. Grant us your salvation. I will hear what the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. Listen to this. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth. Righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and hear this statement, and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Where we go, where we walk, let it be the paths and the steps of the Lord. Let us be careful to follow in them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, I pray that once again you will bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May the Word amplify the life of Christ, the Holy Spirit, have freedom in this place to speak to our hearts, to give us the truth, to make it a personal invitation from us to you. And Lord, extend your hand that we, your people, may reach up and take you by the hand to walk with you. Lord, may your pathway, may your footsteps be the path that we choose today. For your honor and glory and for our benefit, we pray this prayer. Amen. You may be seated. If you go north here, to 12471 Gainesville Highway, all the way up to Blairsville, Georgia. There's a place that's about 11 miles from Brasstown Ball. It's at a place called Blood Mountain, where the Appalachian Trail passes through and crosses this little place. There's a little store and little things there where people can come. And, and the Appalachian Trail, which begins way up in the top of Maine, treks down through the Blue Ridge Mountains and all the ways down and comes to a place 
in North Georgia, over 2,000 miles of the most beautiful and the glorious place that you can, all those hikers that hike it, and they walk those walks, and they, whether it's a beautiful day like today where the leaves are turning and the temperature is great, or a cold day or a rainy day or whatever, I, I probably never will take that walk because it takes months to make that trek, and how tired they must be at the end of it. But I am a walker. I love to take walks. I love to... To, to have that time when I'm, I love to do my praying when I walk. You know, I'm one of those people that when you drive down the road and I'm talking, uh, I'm not singing to the radio and I'm not mad at somebody. I'm usually just talking to the Lord. We just talk like that. We just do things together. And one of the things that God does is He gives us the great privilege of just walking with Him. And I just love to take what they, when I was young, they used to call it having your constitutional, just taking a stroll. And just, I enjoy walking. Now, I don't know that I would enjoy it after 2,000 miles, but uh, I just enjoy that time together. And I think about the passage in Genesis chapter number 3, when in Genesis um, 1 and 2, he created the world, and he put Adam and Eve in that place. And, and they were there, and everything was there for them, and everything was good, and, and they... They only had one thing to do, which was walk with God and enjoy God, and only had one rule. God said, don't do this, and that was the one thing that they ran towards, and they chose to disobey God, and they chose to sin. It says in Genesis 3, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering, hiding from God ashamed because of their sin, knowing that they had chosen wrong, knowing that they had failed God and failed themselves. But the next verse says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This was their habit together. That God, the God of the universe, would come and spend time with them. Walk with them in there in the Garden of Eden in the, the cool of the day. God wanted to, to be with them. Now, time had not begun ticking until they sinned. And when they sinned, when they chose wrong, they began to die. But until that point in time, time stood still. They were living in an eternal state in that place. We don't know how long they were in the Garden of Eden before they came to this place of sin. We don't know how many walks they had taken with God together. How many talks and how they enjoyed that, that glorious time together. And God came down, but they were hiding themselves from God. It says there in verse 8, it says, And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why? Because they felt shame. They felt unworthy. They knew that they had done something, and because of that, there was a break in what they felt was the relationship. It really wasn't the relationship. It was the fellowship. They were still rightly related to God, but something had come in and broken that, that fellowship, and because of that, they ran from God instead of running to God. And God wanted to spend time with them, but they felt like they must hide. Look what it says in verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? He knew where they were. He just was looking for them to confess it. Verse 10. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I wonder how many times he had heard it before. When I heard your voice in the garden, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. They had never been afraid before. There was nothing that would make them run from God before. They loved that time, but they let something to come in and hinder that. Now, instead of finding the joy and the peace from God, now their heart is broken and they're afraid. Verse 11, God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? He knew what they had done. 
But he was looking for them to confess what they had done. Oh, and they began to, to blame. The blame game started then, but it hadn't ended, has it? Adam said, it's her fault. Blaming his wife. Threw her under the bus. She said, well, it's Satan's fault. But God came back and said, look, this is what I will do. And I really, in, in verse 14 and verse 15, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think there's enough gospel there in Genesis 3 that we can see the Lord God coming to us to mend that relationship, to, to invite us back into that fellowship of being with Him. He created us for that. He wants to spend time with us. Matter of fact, that's the point of heaven is that we can be with Him. He's going to prepare a place for you, for us. And if He goes and prepare a place for us, He will come again and receive us unto ourselves that where He is, there we may be also. He planned this from the beginning of time. And when we get to heaven, people talk about all the, the beauties of heaven and all the glories of heaven, but I want you to know that it's simply about being with God, knowing Him, enjoying Him. And I love this phrase, walking with God. Walking with God. Being with Him in that glorious place. The first institution that God made was the family. He, he created marriage and Adam and Eve to be together. Children would come after. That was the first institution, and I believe it pictures of this walk with God. The husband would come and take his wife, and she would receive her husband. Listen to me now. And they would walk together. <clears throat> That's the picture. They would walk together side by side. He would come and bring all that he is to that relationship. She would bring all that she is to that relationship, and they would be one flesh together. People have asked me, said, uh, Pastor, what about marriage? Is it 50-50? And I say, oh, no. Oh, no. It's 100%, 100%. He, the husband's got to bring 100% to it. The wife's got to bring 100% to it. And I really believe God's got to bring 100% to it. And that's where they become, that's where the, the music comes from. That's where the magic happens is in that relationship. You see, he comes with all that he is. She comes with all that she is. He doesn't get ahead of her. She doesn't get ahead of him. They just enjoy the walk together side by side. I, I've shared this before, but... In my home, they, they, I think it was for my birthday, they got me one of those picture frames that's digital that rolls in the pictures, all of it. And there's a picture of, of me and my granddaughter. We had gone out to eat together, and uh, we, it was a picture. I think Lynn took it from behind us. We were walking, and Evangeline had reached up and grabbed a hold of my finger, and we were walking together, and she's holding my hand. And she'll come to the, to the house, and she'll look at that, and when that picture comes up, she'll say, that's my favorite. Guess what? It's my favorite too. Well, it's one of my favorites. There's a few pictures in there, Lynn, that I love as well. And Jody and Jared and Jay. Yeah, I love y'all too. But here, hear this. There's something special about me just having a stroll with my six years old, almost seven year old granddaughter. She just reaches up and grabs a hold of me, and I sure do love it when she reaches down, and I reach down and grab a hold of her, and we're just enjoying that stroll together. Isn't it amazing that the God in heaven who sits on the throne, high and lifted up, perfect in all of his ways, sovereign God, who made the sun come up the morning this morning, who gave us air to breathe, that he would love us, sorry sinners that we are. Come on, you know you are. And yet, he desires that time with us to enjoy us. We know that Satan wants to come and divide and conquer. He always does. He wants to attack relationships as he did with Adam and Eve. So he wants to do between you and your God. But I'm here to tell you, don't let him. 
He's a liar. Don't listen to it. I love what the book of Micah says. Micah chapter number 6. Listen to what he says here in verse chapter 6, verse number 6. With what shall I come before the Lord? You ever thought about it, what you would bring before God? If you're going to bring an offering, a, a, a symbol of your love for God, of all that God has done for you, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calf a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. You know, they, the pagans actually did that in that time. They would take their child, their firstborn, to the god Molech and, and literally give him to that god to be burned alive. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want rivers of oil. He doesn't want thousands of rams to be killed for him. Listen to what he says. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly? Just do the right thing. Love mercy. We're supposed to love each other as much as we love ourselves. And mercy means though they are guilty, you don't hold them accountable to that, you let it go. You free them. You give them mercy. Now you love justice. Do justly. Love mercy, but hear this. Walk humbly before your God. Reach up like Evangeline does. Hold his hand. Knowing that it's not because you're good because he is. Not because you have so much to offer, but because he has so much to give. Just to walk humbly before our God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are to uh, walk by faith and not by sight, not by appearance. Not by how you see it. Well, I think. Well, I won't. Well, I, 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 I. You know, we got an eye problem. He said, don't do that. But come not by the appearance of what you see and what you think and what you know, but, but just come humbly before him and, and by faith grab a hold of the hand of God by believing, trusting in the one that is there. And by the way, I've never seen him face to face, but I've seen his way. I've never heard an audible voice, but I've heard his whisper, and I've felt his peace. I've heard his call. I've been there when he put his arms of love around me and pulled me close. I've been there when he sat me down and gave me correction, but yet told me that he was there for me and he loved me and he forgave me and he encouraged me. By faith, we see him and we walk with him. I love, it sounds like I love all the Bible and if it, if it does sound like that, it's because I do. But in John chapter 5, Jesus is talking here, and it just absolutely blessed my soul when I heard the way Jesus said how he lived his life. John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son, speaking of himself, the Son of God who is now the Son of Man, the Son can do nothing of himself. Y'all like that? That's the humility of Christ. He says here, he said, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. 
and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. You know what he says? He said, I'm here to serve him. I'm here to walk with him. And God is with me. So I don't do anything on my own. What I see him do, that's what I do. He goes on in verse 30. He says, what, what I hear him say, that's what I follow. As we are to walk with Jesus, in the same manner Jesus walked with God, knowing that he was there, knowing that he was watching over him, knowing that he didn't have to do it. Listen to me now. Knowing that he didn't have to do it, he just joined in what God was leading him to do. As we reach to grab hold of the hand of, of Jesus, he was always grabbing a hold of the hand of God. He walked with him and he spent time with him. He prayed to him. He trusted in him. He followed him and he obeyed him, even to the place of death, even the death of the cross. Because he knew he could entrust his life to him because God would raise him up. And by the way, he sure did. What a glorious walk with God there, constantly communicating. In Psalms chapter 77, verse 19, there's a verse that always intrigued me. Look up there on the screen. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. Have you ever been out in the water when all you could see was the water? Couldn't see the land anymore? By the way, there aren't any road signs out there. There's not any billboards. And there's not any footprint. You just have to listen and follow the Spirit of God. But He'll direct your path. You may say, well, I'm, I'm really, if I could ever see to know, by faith you can. By faith you really can. Paul said in Galatians 5, he said, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I am going to do a funeral this afternoon of a sweet, sweet, elegant lady, Miss Margaret Lefty. Went to a funeral earlier this week of my brother. I always called him Ronnie when he got older enough. He changed his name. He was Ron, you know, because he was dignified. You know, he was in the in the ministry as well. Only pastored one church, but he pastored it for forty five years. One church. He was a he was a mean old goat. He was so strict. He he. He loved God so much and he wanted to make sure that everybody loved God the way he loved God. And he was always going to do whatever he thought was the right thing to, to honor God no matter what it was. I remember he uh, had on a pair of slacks and a shirt and uh, it was all buttoned up, had a tie on and there was a swimming party. So he was trying to make a point. So he just jumped in with his shirt and tie on. I'm like, you're trying to make a point, but I don't know if it's the point you were trying to make. Hope you got that wash and wear stuff because you, all you are is wet, you know. But he was doing it because he was trying to show people that you should do things the right way. His what he thought was his way. But I, I tell you what, he had a passion. He had a passion for God. And the thing that was so, so amazing was he wanted everybody else to know God the way he knew God. He was seventy-seven. About to be 78 years old if he had made it to December. Went through a lot of things. A lot of troubles along the way. Three weeks ago, he was there in when they buried his daughter, who died of a brain tumor. He drove his wife to the funeral. <laughs> he drove about an hour and a half to get there. I think he fought it tooth and nail because he wanted to be there when Miss Susie, that's what he called his wife, Miss Susie. He wanted to be there for her to help her. 
be her strength that she was going to walk through it. You know, I, I said there's a place up there by Blood Mountain on the Appalachian Trail where people walk that trail, but right there where it crosses the highway, there's a tree there called the boot tree. And you, there are people that will, I, I, I've said this before, I think some of them, they just start at the very beginning, which is a few miles down the road, and they probably just take a few miles trek, and they say, you know what, I'm done. I'm walking away. But for those who are taking this southern track that start all the way up there in Maine and work their way down, when they get there to the end, they know that they finished the course and they sit down and they take off their boots and tie them together and they throw them up in the tree to say that their journey is done and maybe it's just a little bit of encouragement for somebody else along the way. And I think about Miss Ledford and how she probably took those very dainty slippers of hers off and slipped in slipped into some glory slippers. They used to sing that song, I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day. I think about my brothers. His boots were probably worn and tattered and probably had a few holes. And to be honest, they probably smelled a little bit. But this past week, last Sunday night, he got to take off those shoes, throw them up in the tree, slide on those glorious prepared for him from the foundation of the world. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself. To where I am, <laughs> there you can be also. I told everybody at the funeral, at Ron's funeral, I said, I don't know who's up there, but I guarantee you they need to get out of the way because when Ron got there, he was going to make a beeline to wherever Jesus was. And I wouldn't want to get in his way because that's the way that he lived his life. Can you imagine what it would be like? We talk about to look into the eyes of our Lord and see him face to face. <laughs> but I wonder... I wonder if we got to that place, would we fall on our knees before Him? To worship, that's what the word worship means is to bow down. I don't know what it would be like. But can't you just see Jesus just reaching down that wonderful hand and touching Him there and helping Him up and holding hands with the Lord of glory? You know, they may say, Brian, you have an invitation to the White House. I'd say I'm not worthy. They may say you have this privilege or that privilege. And folks, today, I take it a high honor, the privilege and the honor that you gave us today in pastor appreciation. I understand that. And I appreciate that. And I feel honored. But you know, nothing's going to compare to the day that I'm home. We were created for such. Jesus died to make the way for such. We can just grab a hold. But I wonder how many times we turn loose. I think about Evangeline holding my hand, perfect communion there. But you know, when I was a kid, and they wanted to hold my hand, you know, sometimes all I could do was wanted to pull, pull away, run and go get in some mischief that you didn't need to get into. And yet, when you found yourself in trouble, who did you want to get back to as quickly as possible? I wonder. This Christian life is described as a walk. But I pray that it's a walk with Him. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you know nothing about this walk. 
And if you die in your sins without His forgiveness, if you do not want to know Him as Savior and Lord, if you do not want to receive His gift of salvation, you don't have to have it. But you'll spend your eternity separated from Him. But if you're wise enough to give your life to Him, you can walk through time and you can walk through eternity hand in hand with Jesus Christ our Savior.